Luckily, we like to uh, have a moment where we share stories in our worship time. And our vision statement is real people finding real hope in the real world. And we believe that we're all on a journey and that we have opportunities to share our journey with others. And so I want to introduce you to uh, Eric and Amanda Green. Eric and Amanda are new to the Brook. And um, in fact, Eric is going to be working more with our worship team. We couldn't be more excited about his involvement, their involvement, and then coming on board with the church. They have four beautiful children. And they recently had a transition in their life to Houston that I thought would be great for you to hear about as we're talking about the book of Esther. And we're talking about life taking twists and turns that are unexpected. So, guys, thanks for being willing to share. And I wonder if you could share a little bit about that transition that you had that, again, was unexpected, that, yeah. that God really uh, interrupted your life and brought you here. Sure. Um, so we lived in Nashville for about 10 years. Uh, I, I traveled as a full-time musician and did that whole world of, of music. And uh, it got to the point where I was on the road too, too much. And uh, we started to pray about a change. And we needed to change. I needed to get off the road, but yet still be able to do ministry and music. And God opened huge doors um, for us to move to Alabama and work for a ministry in Alabama full-time. And uh, so in 2015, we moved to Alabama, and we were there for about three and a half years. And our time there, um, what I tell people is it was a promised land place for us. We, um, it, it brought a lot of answered prayers for us, and um, it just was, we were kind of in the milk and honey kind of season, you know? But yet... Within that season, we, we had a lot of struggles. We had a lot of frustrations and disappointments, and spiritually, emotionally. And um, even though our time there was uh, the best and the, and the worst of times, uh, we had a peace. God gave us a peace, you know, to get through that season. Uh, but there got to be a point where we knew that the season there was over. And um, it wasn't necessarily a thing that we wanted. Um, uh, or expected at all, um, but it was kind of like God was like, okay, you're done, and we're like, okay, <laughs> we're done, um, and so um, I resigned from my position there, and we kind of, it was like, oh, Lord, what do, you know, why did we do that? Why did we have to do that? And um, uh, so, you know, during that transition, we, we dealt with a lot of thoughts and emotions and fear and frustration and anger and uh, the feeling of loss from a lot of things, a lot of the good things that we were experiencing there. And so it wasn't an easy transition for us. And so um, because we, we owned a house there, we had to sell a house. And um, our even though I, I resigned at the end of December last year, we didn't move to Houston till uh, basically the middle of February. And so um, even getting to Houston was um, a hard decision for us because we only heard go to Houston. We didn't know why we were coming to Houston. God said resign and get to Houston. And so that was really difficult for us. Uh, we never thought about coming back to Houston. We were raised here. We met here. But like I said, in 2005, we moved from here and we, we never looked back. But God had a different plan, you know. And it wasn't necessarily a part of what we thought the plan was. And so it was an interesting moment in our time. So really as a result of turmoil that was yeah. taking place yeah. there, yeah. you were kind of uh, thrust into a situation where God was saying very clearly, hey, you need to go. And we all love Houston, but <laughs> as you've described it to me, yeah. you know, it just felt like a big step backwards for you in, in yeah. your life coming, yeah. coming here. So Amanda, I'd be interested to hear from you uh, just about your feelings and what what was the emotion or the emotions that you were going through in this in this season probably for us um like you mentioned we have four children um right now 12 to 2 and um you know the probably the biggest emotion that we all felt in different ways was was loss we <laughs> each experienced that loss um mm -hmm. because like Eric said, you know, it, there were wonderful things that God brought to us during our time there in Alabama, and we felt so many answered prayers and so many good things happening, growth in our children, and 
you know, in our in our family dynamic after him being on the road, we were, you know, it was just a really healing time for us, but it was also very difficult. Um, and so, you know, coming out of, you know, coming here, <laughs> which we never yeah. expected, um, I think we all just had to process through the loss of mm-hmm. the good things, you mm-hmm. know, um, because were removed from that situation and so you know parenting our children through their tangible feeling of loss you know mm-hmm. when we were also experiencing that was um, hard yeah. so. one of the reasons that I wanted you to share is because you're really on the front end of all this still or maybe in the middle in between sure. that yeah. place in between we all find ourselves in lives is in between and not having resolution yet and so we've all been there. We can relate to what you're going through, and there may be people here that are exactly in that same situation. Um, have you come to the point yet where you're able to see anything yet come together? Um, are you getting glimpses of kind of what God is doing? Yeah, um, it was interesting. As we were talking about this, Amanda and I were talking about this, um, you know, we as far as the grandeur or the big picture of of the why God, you know, no, but um, we definitely have, you know, we're almost here now a year, and throughout this year, we've definitely had, God has given us tokens of why, tokens of faith to hold on to, and, um, you know, I mentioned this earlier, but just the fact that, you know, sometimes God goes a little quiet on us sometimes, and the only thing that we've been standing on is the word that we heard last. And that's sometimes what we all can stand on is, is, hey, get to Houston. And we're like, okay, God. And then sometimes he stays quiet for a season, you know, and all we have to do is stay faithful in that decision and, and, and be obedient to that one thing. And God is faithful through the, the quietness. He is faithful through the tokens of things and just very simple, practical things as far as even for our kids. They were very involved with the dance in, in Alabama, and it was very – they were feeling that loss of, of having the dance experience, and they're very talented in that. And God has allowed us to find an amazing dance uh, club, or it's a Christian faith-based uh, thing for them, and it's, it's amazing. And uh, for us, you know, we've, we've seen, seen different tokens. I mean, just finding the Brook, a local body, you know, with us being in full-time ministry for many years, we've never had to find a church, you know, and so we've been blessed to find this body and, and make really great relationships so far, and um, and so, yeah, you know, like, big picture, we don't quite see it, you know, and, and that's okay, mm-hmm. um, but as far as having those moment, those tokens of faith along the way is what we're holding on to. Well, and this is the essence of faith that so many times believers miss. It's walking into the unknown, and it's walking into the unfamiliar without having all the answers, and there's real seasons like that. And yet, as we talked about last week, we can have the assurance that God is still working behind the scenes. And you may not see it now, but the promise is is that he will honor those who are seeking to honor him, and I believe that you are. You're a beautiful young family. You're seeking to honor the Lord, and just figure it out. Yeah. And uh, I have no doubt that he's going to take care of you. And I hope that part of the answer to your prayers is this church home. Absolutely. So, yes. Uh, yes. Let's do this. I want to ask you to stand. Let's, let's thank them, okay? Let's thank them for... Uh, yeah, you can stand. <laughs> let's pray for Eric and Amanda, okay? Father, thank you for just this opportunity and these dear people for their heart to uh, serve you and to do what you want. God, I pray that you would continue to provide for them, Lord, that you would allow them to see even glimpses of what you're doing and more so learn about who you are, Father, and that uh, each step along the way, as the picture becomes clearer, they would look back and see how faithful you've been to them. So, We pray for them, their family, their kids, and we thank you for this opportunity, Father. We thank you for what you're doing in our church and the special sense of of your mission and destiny that we feel here at the Brook. And uh, we just want to give this night to you now as we look at your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys again. All right, you can be seated again. You've kind of been up and down tonight a little bit, haven't you? If you have a Bible... I want to invite you to turn to the Old Testament book of Esther. 
We're going to look in chapters 3 and 4 tonight. Last week we looked at chapters 1 and 2. We're in this series called For Such a Time as This. In fact, that's the phrase we're going to look at tonight. That amazing, it's really the greatest and the most famous phrase in all the book of Esther is when Mordecai says to her, perhaps you've come to this royal position for such a time as this. Perhaps God has arranged life in a certain way for such a time as this, for you to be used. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to talk about divine appointments. We're going to talk about what it means to follow God and have those moments where we feel like God is leading us, even without all the answers in advance, but God is leading us to do what he wants us to do. Most of our days are filled with appointments. Isn't that true? We have doctor appointments. We have dentist appointments. We have business appointments. Some of you guys are business people. Uh, You have an appointment to catch a flight. And so those appointments are selected, scheduled times when we must show up to meet someone or to do something. Now, there's a time and space dimension to them, right? We have to be on time to our appointments. Now, doctors and dentists don't have to be on time, but we have to be, right? We have to be on time. Uh, I remember one time uh, being uh, at the airport, and I was going to a conference with a friend of mine, and we actually... We're standing not far from the gate, and uh, we missed our flight. We were just standing there talking. The flight just took off. We're like, hey, it seems like time is kind of going, and we went up to the gate, and he said, the flight's already left, so we, we missed our appointment <laughs> with, with our flight. So when we talk about appointments, we think about this fact that God also sets times and spaces for us to be used In special way. So, as we talk about that tonight, what I want to do is I want to talk about this whole idea of divine appointments in the first place. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, We can talk about you know God leading us, the Holy Spirit leading us, but what does that actually mean for us in our Christian life? So, it first of all means this: that divine appointments are not abnormal in the Christian life. They shouldn't be. The leadership of the Holy Spirit in our life should be something that's normal for every believer. All believers should have some sense of God directing them to the point where their lives intersect with his purpose in some way in this world. We all have unique roles to play in the great things that God is doing in the world. And so that purpose that he seeks to achieve, he wants to use us to achieve it. Because of you, because of your context, because of your strengths, your position, your resources, your personality, your gifts, your abilities. So coming to faith in Christ is the beginning of this living relationship with God, this ongoing relationship where we have dialogue with him and God is prompting us and leading us to these divine appointments. Here's the second thing that's true about divine appointments. They vary in scope and intensity. So uh, some people think about these things. They think about them in the really grand ways. In fact, we're going to look at one today as we look at Esther. This was a pretty grand and intense divine appointment that she had. But divine appointments come in both small and large ways. The truth is. And so some call for response for us to walk through a season, just like Eric and Amanda talked about, maybe even a long season where we have to bear some responsibility, that we have to be faithful daily in some way. We have to be consistent, this daily and long-standing kind of walking with God that involves this daily decision to follow Christ. Other types of divine appointments are intense and large in scale and scope. Sometimes God comes along and there's something that's major going on, a big moment of decision, right? A big risk that we have to take, a pivotal moment that turns our lives really in a whole other direction or the lives of other people. And what I want to say is that both of these are really important in the Christian life. Here's the next thing that's true. Divine appointments result from spiritual sight and preparation. They really do. In fact, we're going to see that today with Mordecai and with Esther that there's a process that allows us to be sensitive to the leadings of God in our lives. So divine appointments call for us to see with spiritual eyes, to have a God consciousness, a basic theology also that understands what God is really trying to accomplish in the world. So as we understand that, then we can be involved in it. It involves walking with God in such a way that we would respond to him when he leads us to do so. When prayer becomes a habit, And when listening to the Holy Spirit becomes a habit, then seeing God work then becomes a lifestyle. 
It becomes something that we get used to. In fact, sometimes God takes us on adventures to prepare us for the next time that he's going to call us to do something else, to get our spiritual muscle memory up. And that's what we need to uh, do when it comes to responding to these promptings and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So this is the nature of divine appointments. But how do you know? How do you know when you have one? There are numerous answers to that question. But from Esther chapter 3 and 4, we can be sure of at least three times when we know without a doubt that our appointed time is now. Our appointed time to act in faith and obedience is now. What are those times? Well, here's the first time. It's our appointed time when you're called upon to compromise your convictions. You can have no doubt that when you're called upon and pressure is brought to bear upon you to compromise your convictions, it is time from God to you to step up and step out and to stand up for what you believe in. Let's think about this. If we're looking in Esther chapter 3, chapter 3 opens up with a problem. Here's the problem. Let's read about it. After these things, King Xerxes promoted Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow, nor did he pay homage to him. So what's, what's going on here? This man named Haman had been elevated to a huge position in the kingdom. He was second most powerful in the kingdom, and the king had demanded that everybody bow down in public recognition to him. Everybody must do it, but Mordecai says, I can't do that. I can't can't bow. I can't pay homage to another man. I cannot worship him. He refuses to do so. This is what the scripture is talking about here. If we read on, verses 3 and 4, the officials now come to... Uh, Mordecai, and they say to him, how are you not doing this? You know, you're going to get in trouble. And the Bible tells us that they talked to him daily. And when he refused to bow down to Haman, they told Haman about it. And they basically say to Haman, listen, he's a Jew, and the Jewish people will not bow down to men or to systems of men. It's a part of their religion, and you know that that's really a part of the Jewish commandments. You shall worship the Lord your God and him alone. I mean, this was huge. They would not bow down. And so they take this, and Haman takes this news about the Jews to the king, to the king. And so he says to the king, there are a group of people who will not abide by your law. He's tattling on them. And then Haman says this, here's what I want to do. I want to get rid of them. They're going to be a headache to you. They're not going to obey what you want anyway. In fact, king, I will pay you 10,000 talents of silver if you will let me do this. A boatload of money. For the king. The king says, keep your money, but we're going to do it. As you read in the scripture, the king puts his signet ring on the law, and the law of Haman is passed, and now it becomes the edict in the land. So now, not only is Mordecai in trouble, but listen, the whole race of Jews. This is what we were referring to last week when we're talking about the extinction of God's people. Listen, all the Jews in the known world were a part of the Persian kingdom at this time. And if the king had followed through with this, they would have been exterminated. It would have been the extermination of their race. So you know it's your God-appointed time. Listen, when you're called upon to compromise your convictions, Mordecai had integrity with his faith, and that's what I remind us about tonight. Our appointed time to stand up and to step out is when we're called upon to compromise our convictions, which we must not ever do. Integrity means that we live consistently with our words, with our actions, and with our values. And so to have a value and to have a belief but not live it out in what we say and what we do is indeed a lack of integrity. God calls us to have integrity. I want to read for you a story, give you an example of a nine-year-old little league player named Tanner Muncy of Wellington, Florida whose truth-telling landed him in the pages of Sports Illustrated a few years ago. Here's what it says. Tanner was playing first base when the ball was hit to him, and he reached out to tag a base runner, and as he ran from first to second, the umpire said, you're out. But Tanner said to the umpire, excuse me, but uh, he missed me with the tag. (laughs) And the umpire said, well, what do you mean? 
Well, anyway, well, he, he missed me with the tag. And they went back and forth for a little bit. The umpire said, well, okay. And then later on, as the game continued, you can see this picture, right, of this kid saying this, this little kid saying this to the umpire, saying it very respectfully. Can you imagine this taking place, you know, uh, on the field? But two weeks later, Tanner was playing shortstop in another game. When the ball was hit to him, he went to tag another runner. And this was, this was the time when Tanner was actually tagging the runner. And the umpire looked at the play and said, he's out. But Tanner said, no, I missed him. He's safe. <laughs> he admitted to the umpire that he had actually missed the tag. So guess what the umpire did? The umpire thought this boy was a very honest boy, so he changed his call. He changed the decision there because of the little integrity of this little guy who would tell the truth even when it would cost him something, such as the out in the game. That's a small illustration, but if you blow this up, you come to understand that here's a little guy that was learning integrity from the onset and telling the truth, even when it would cost him. So the question for us is, will you stay true to your values when it's difficult? Mordecai did. Here's the next thing I think that illustrates for us when our point in time is now, when your position can be used for God's purposes. The story continues, okay? In chapter 4, it now begins to get very interesting. Mordecai tears his clothes because he finds out what's going on, what's going to happen to the Jewish people. So he tears his clothes. It's a sign of mourning and uh, it's the clothing of sorrow. He puts on sackcloth and ashes. The pain is deep and great. He is declaring hopelessness. He's in great mourning. And so Esther sends clothes out to Mordecai from the palace and encourages him to change these clothes from sackcloth and ashes. And he actually rejects them. And verse 5 says, Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why it was going on. She had no idea. Go on, verse 6. Mordecai tells the servant all that happened. Tells her servant all that happened. In fact, gives the servant a copy of the edict to take back to Esther. And in verse 8, he instructs the servant. He says this to the servant. Hey, Tech, read this to her. Tell her to go to the king and tell him who you are, Esther. Tell the king who you are. Remember, her identity had been hidden. Now's the time for you to tell him. You've gained favor in his sight. Let it out of the bag. Now is the time for you to reveal that you're a Jew. Also, let it be known who you are, who your people are. So Esther, here's the idea. Esther, you're not in the place you are just because you're pretty. You've been put there for some reason. God knew that this day would come. It's time for you to use what you've been given for the purpose of God. It's time to use your position, your influence, what he's given you for a God-sized purpose. And I want to remind all of us that God does the same with us. God has placed us in positions. I don't care what it is. He's placed us in positions at this certain time to be used for a purpose of some kind. We talked about time in between, right? But those in-between times are some of the most important times of our lives, that God is working behind the scenes. He's positioning us for something that he wants to do. You don't have to wonder about this. This is when God wants to use us, when he has positioned us for certain things. You might be a boss, an employer, a manager of some kind. Are you using what God has given you for his purposes? So here's the problem. Many times we're in the position, but we don't have eyes to see the purpose. or We don't know the purpose that's going on. And so we doubt that there is one. But what we have to do is we have to see the spiritual opportunity. Talked about this sensitivity to God, this God consciousness in our lives. We're aware that he is doing something. So if your sight is all about the physical, then you don't see behind the scenes. You don't see the opportunity. That's what's going on here with, with Esther. She hears about this. She sends word back to Mordecai. Let's look in verses 10 and 11. Here's what she says. Then she instructed him, that is her servant, to say to Mordecai, listen, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, <laughs> that they be put to death. 
unless the king extends the golden scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. He hasn't called me in for a long time. And you're asking me to go to him, though I've not been called. And let me explain something to you, Mordecai. There's this one rule that the king has that if you go uninvited to him and he does not hold out the royal scepter, I'm a dead person. And she essentially says to Mordecai, I'm not willing to do that. She did what we do. She misdiagnosed an opportunity for God to work. See, all we can see is, well, this has a negative effect on me. She forgot something. She forgot, again, that if it wasn't for the goodness of God, if it wasn't for the grace of God, she wouldn't be there at all. Esther, you did not get there on your own. It's easy for us to forget, isn't it, how we got to where we are. It's easy to forget once you start enjoying the blessings of God in the context in which he has placed you. It's easy to forget. If it were not for the grace of God, I would not be in the position that I am now. I read this this week, and I just marveled again. Periodically, I marvel. If if you understood how foreign... It is for me to be where I am at my life now, given the context of my upbringing. (laughs) You would laugh and you would marvel like me. The, The thought of me becoming a believer and a pastor and someone who would stand up and speak to others is, it was just so far remote. But I am fully convinced, and I know, I know deep in my heart, if it wasn't for the goodness and the grace of God, I would not be in this place, and it humbles me when I remember that. And all of us need a dose of that, Uh, periodically, just to marvel at the faithfulness of God and bringing us to the place that we are. So the moment that I lose sight of that, listen, which is what Esther did, the moment that I lose sight of that, and as Paul said, when Paul said, listen, I'm the chief of sinners, Paul said, I only am what I am by the grace of God. The moment that I lose sight of that, now my position and my role has been illegitimized because it's become about me. And I want to remind you that the things of God, that God has granted you are not solely and only about you. He has some purpose for you in the position, in the time, in the space in which you are. But Esther says no. She says no. Mordecai gets that answer back from her, and then he writes back, which leads to the third way that we can know when it's our time. We know it's our time when the clear answer to a spiritual conflict is your step of faith. Again, you can have no doubt about it. When you know clearly that the answer to a problem of some kind, is you taking a step of faith in God, that is when it's your time to step up and to stand up. Faith is risky. It just is. By nature, it's risky. So let's read here verses 13 and 14 of Esther chapter 4. So Mordecai sent back this answer. There's this communication going on to Esther. Here's what he says to her. He says, Esther, do not think because you're in the king's house, that you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. He's warning her, listen, don't think that just because of the position that you are that you're going to be spared from extermination also. But Esther, let me give you a little bit of a theology lesson here. If you don't do what God is asking you to do for such a time as this, God is going to be faithful to his promise. He's going to raise someone else up, and in some other way, he is going to stay true to his promise to the people of Israel. He's going to do that. And who knows? Who knows, he says, and here it is, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. He's instructing her, Esther, this is your point in time. This is your moment. This is your God moment. This is the moment that God seeks to use you and he has placed you where he wants you for this very purpose. God wants you, Esther. God doesn't need you, but he wants you. 
He wants you to be in on what he's doing. While God would like to use you, Esther, prefers to use you, Esther, would rather use you, Esther, if he can't use you, he will find some other way. Why? Because God never allows men to subvert his sovereign will. He never does. Nobody is indispensable when it comes to his kingdom purposes. His kingdom, his church, his people will be fine without us. But God in his sovereignty will make sure that what he wants done is done. Why? Because he is true to his word. He's going to do what he has promised to do. So Esther gets this word from Mordecai. Now here's her response. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are in Susa. Fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And here it is. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. And there it is. There's the moment of obedience for her. This is the moment when she crossed the line of faith to step into what God had arranged for her all along to do and to be in that moment. She says, if I perish, I perish. Now let's talk about that phrase because it's so important when we come to understand faith in the Bible. It's really important. It is graduate level obedience going on here. It's on display here in her life. You see it all over the Bible. You see it with the life of Joseph when Joseph was tempted also to compromise, and yet he stood upon what was his convictions, and he stepped through. Nehemiah, the same thing. Daniel, remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those three men there in Persia also, under King, I'm sorry, in Babylon, under King Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel chapter 3, the story of the fiery furnace. Remember, these men were told to bow. It's very similar in essence They were told to bow to King Nebuchadnezzar, and they refused. They would not do it. And the king comes to them and says, you're going to do it, or you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. You're going to be burnt alive. And they respond to the king, whether that's right for you to do or not, O king, that's up to you. But we will not bow because our God is able to deliver us. But they add something to to that. That's not the end of their statement to the king. Our God is able to deliver us, but even if he does not, we will not bow to you. And that's what I want to talk about. That's how I want to apply this tonight. I want to talk about the even if God does not kind of faith. Eric and Amanda, the even if God does not. God, we're going to obey you even if you don't follow through with my expectations. Even if you don't meet Uh, the requirements that I have of faith in you, I'm going to pay the price. I'm going to pay the cost of following you, and I'm going to be willing to do it. And Esther said, if I perish, I perish. That's God's problem. It's my responsibility to be obedient. You know, we always talk about that there's a cost to discipleship. There's a cost to following Jesus. But when then it comes along for us to pay that cost, we're unwilling to do it. We complain about it. And we go, this is a part of the Christian life. This is what it means to follow God. So understanding God's grace is that sometimes God's grace takes us to places also that we'd like to avoid, that we'd prefer not to be in, things that are hard and discouraging and sad. God's grace gives us wonderful gifts in times of plenty and prosperity, but it also will take us to places where precious things are taken away from us because God wants to do something both in us and through us. So ultimately, what we were talking about last week is the need that we have for control, for absolute control of our lives. And here's the truth about faith. And finally, Esther was just able to let go of control, even her very life. You can either have faith or you can have control. But you can't have both. You have to be willing to let go in order for God to take control. If you want God to do something off the chart, you have to take your hands off of the control. If you want God to provide in supernatural ways, ways that can't be explained by you and your intellect and your decisions, if you want God to show up and to show off and to do something amazing, 
then you have to be willing to trust him by letting go of control, to stepping into the unfamiliar and the unknown. All along the way, trusting that God will provide. And as we see, he's faithful. He's faithful. So last week, we talked about God behind the scenes. We said, listen, our Esther prayer for week one was, God, even when I can't see you, I will trust that you're in control. Here's our prayer for week two. That I want to encourage you to pray again, not only tonight, but this whole next week. God, whatever you've placed in my hands, I will use for my purpose, for your purposes. Whatever you've placed in my hands, I will use for your purposes. When we look at Mordecai and Esther, Esther, we see that God has granted them certain things. Mordecai was an official at the gate. He had access to the king and therefore was able to receive information, give information, and to respond as he did, even as an official. Esther was put in a position for a purpose. And their prayer ultimately was, God, I will use what you've given to me for your purposes beyond my own. So let's do that, okay? Let's bow in prayer. Let's bow in prayer. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to um, allow you a moment just to reflect and to respond upon God's word to your life tonight, to the worship, to the testimony. How has God spoken to you? And some of you may have come into the room with anxiety um, and frustration even. You know, I've learned about that in my life because, boy, I experience it too. I've learned the areas of my life where I have anxiety or frustration or impatience are the areas of my life that have not fully submitted to the control and the lordship of Christ. And any area that is not under the lordship of Jesus is an area that I worry about. And so I wonder what it is that you're clinging to, that you're holding tightly to tonight. That God has placed in your hands. And it could be even a gift from him. Do you remember the story of Abraham when Abraham was called to offer his son Isaac on the altar? This was so unusual, such an unusual request that God had never made it of another human being calls Abraham to sacrifice his son. And remember, Isaac was the son that God had given to him. And so sometimes the very dreams that God gives us are the very dreams he calls us to let go of. And as Abraham raised that dagger, God stopped him and said, Abraham, stay your hand for now I know that you will withhold nothing from me. Well, folks, will, will you not withhold your comfort? Would you be willing to pay that price, that cost to follow God? What is that thing that is so precious to you? And God is calling you to let go of control. So let me just allow you a moment, just quietly, privately between you and God in your heart to pray that prayer. God, whatever you've given to me, I will use for your purposes. the good, the bad, the times of abundance, the times of discomfort, whatever it is, here and now, I will use for your purposes.
Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this story of a real man and real woman who had a crisis of faith, who had to stand up for what they believed in. even at the cost of their very lives. So help us be willing to pay the price to follow you. And if that price means some discomfort and uneasiness, if that price means not having all the answers, if that, if that price means walking through a season of the unknown, give us the peace deep in our hearts to be willing to say yes to you. Yes, I'll pay the price. I'll gladly pay that price because I know that you're a good God. And I let go of control. And I trust you. Well, this is our prayer, Father. Help us to walk in the reality of that prayer. Help us to walk in a consciousness of your presence and your spirit in our lives throughout this next week, these coming days, so that, Lord, we could see when our appointed time is and we could respond with faith and obedience as you lead us and that we will see how you will use us in what you're doing in this world. We trust you for these things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.